Hello and welcome everybody. I'm very glad that I'm speaking today to Professor Peter Seeberger. What does it mean for you to receive the Emil Fischer Medal? Well, it's a huge honor to receive a medal named after the big hero of carbohydrate chemistry, Emil Fischer. He started our field. I've worked in the field for 25 years now, so receiving a medal named after him, that's sort of the biggest thing I think you can achieve in this regard. And what fascinates you most about carbohydrate chemistry? Well, carbohydrates are 80% of biomass. And half is what we see on land, the other half is in the ocean. We don't know much about it all. And carbohydrates are responsible for so many functions in our lives. But as chemists, there are still many challenges. So Emil Fischer was the first one to connect two monosaccharides and make a disaccharide. And what we see outside in nature, these are polysaccharides that oftentimes are thousands of units long, real biopolymers. And um, what I wanted to make is I want to make all the different kinds of carbohydrates that show up in nature. Because I believe in what Richard Feynman once said. He said, I only understand what I can make. And so I think by being able to make a carbohydrate, I can study its structure, I can study its function, and then I can understand why it behaves the way it does, and maybe I can even imitate it or improve on it. So it's a unique opportunity to really deep down understand nature and then use these natural compounds to have effects such as prevention uh, of disease, vaccines, or maybe a treatment of diseases. Yeah, and you've made many, many different carbohydrates. So can you say a little bit more about your research? So I got into carbohydrate research because um, I'm a simple kind of guy. And there are three main biopolymers. The first biopolymer that all of us know is genetic material, DNA. So DNA um, takes information and transfers it from one generation to the next. And via RNA, another biopolymer, um, it translates into proteins. And the proteins carry out all reactions in biology. They are main catalyst enzymes. And those enzymes are then needed to make the third major biopolymer, namely carbohydrates. Now, arrogantly speaking, I think it's because of organic chemists we know so much about DNA and RNA and about peptides and proteins. Because Bruce Merrifield how, showed us how to make peptides in 1962 uh, by solid phase peptide uh, synthesis. For that, he got a Nobel Prize in 1984. Um, and today, basically anybody can get a peptide made by an automated synthesizer or you just order it and it comes to you. My PhD advisor, Marv Carruthers, developed automated DNA chemistry in 1980. And that really was the birth of molecular biology as you know it today. Because without automated synthesis, no primers, without primers, no PCR reaction, without PCR reaction, no amplification, no second generation sequencing, nothing. So if you think about it, so two chemists had already taken care of oligonucleotides, oligopeptides, so it was a third class carbohydrates. So when I was a PhD student, I thought, I'm going to work on carbohydrates because nobody has done that, and I'm going to be a guy who is going to do that for carbohydrates. So very simple. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, what, what else has inspired you during your career? Um, well, like most of us probably I can say my high school teacher was important because he was a pretty cool guy. He was a tough guy and um, he made chemistry fun. Um, and what I liked about chemistry was simply the fact that it was not just theory, it was also theory and, and tough theory sometimes, but it was also a practical component. So by the end of the day you could create new molecules. So create something completely new that's never on Earth. To me, that is something very, very attractive. Um, and then, of course, there are many colleagues as you go along uh, throughout your career that um, inspire you. One of the people that I found very inspiring was my chemical grandfather, Har Gobind uh, Korana. Um, he is a chemist, figured out the genetic code. He made all the trinucleotides, and then he figured that out. And so I think throughout my career, people have impact on me that showed that chemistry can be used for something. And it's my deep belief that chemistry should be done for itself. It's a fundamental science, but if you do really fundamentally new things, you can then also create new opportunities for application. And this is what I think in my career came out, is that we focused on very, very basic aspects of trying to understand glycosylation reactions over so union of two sugars. But afterwards, we use the molecules that we create to try to do either diagnostic, therapeutic, or vaccine application. So it's always this balance between really basic science and really um, application-driven research in the end.
Mm -hmm. And you have um, several spin-ups, uh, spin-up companies in the US and in Switzerland. And you've also started a foundation in Africa. Can you say a bit about the motivation and what um, is your drive there? Yeah, so I never had intended to start any companies. And by the end of the day now, so far, there have been nine of them. Um, I think the first company we started in the United States because people wanted access to carbohydrates. And we had this new fast method to make carbohydrates. And I couldn't make them in my lab and they still wanted them. So we said, well, some of my students, we should probably set up a company to start selling um, the carbohydrates. And so that worked out pretty well. We ended up selling this company after um, 11 years. And I think that sort of a pattern has repeated itself over and over again, that we would find something chemically or biologically interesting, uh, but we realized that <clears throat> there was maybe a medical need that we could address and uh, that we could not do this at a research institution or a university where it used to be because that's just not our task to create products. Um, but still there was this opportunity and this need and people wanted that. Um, so we don't want to sort of meet that demand. And so that's why we started um, the companies. And once you've done it once, you know how to do it and then it gets easier. And so time and time we, we just did this a few more times. And initially it was not really just meant to make money. Um, it was really meant to meet that need. But don't get me wrong, I got no problem making money either. So that's, that's okay. Um, but I think once you make money, you also realize that um, we're quite fortunate in the sense that we get good education, we have good health care, um, life's pretty good for most of us. I complain, but overall I think there's not really a threat to the very basics of our life. And um, it was in 2003 when I met somebody who's now my friend, David Tesfai, who uh, grew up in Ethiopia. And um, one of his uh, brothers died from malaria when he was little. And so it's a very real thing. One of your relatives dying from infectious disease that in uh, Germany, we could treat for less than 30 euros, we could cure that person. <clears throat> and you realize that maybe access to health care, maybe prevention for vaccines, but also health care for medications is something really, really important. And so <clears throat> with David, I visited uh, Ethiopia and I realized that r for us, relatively small amounts of money can make quite a big difference in people's lives. And so in 2004, we started the Test for Ilk a Foundation. Ilk was a, a Swiss engineer who built the railroad in um, Ethiopia and uh, so we named it after him. Um, and the foundation um, has cr helped create a bed net factory to make bed nets to um, protect uh, people from the bite by the flies that uh, then transmit malaria. Um, subsequently, we helped uh, building a vocational school, a Berufsschule of Deutsch. Um, and we have now built an entrepreneurship uh, program. Again, <coughs> this was together with some um, friends and um, colleagues in Switzerland that now drive this uh, foundation forward. And of course, it's just a relatively small operation, but we feel, okay, every little bit we can help uh, bring something forward. So um, I like to see things change and the foundation is just one thing to maybe try to make a small change in the life for some people. Hmm. And um, to come back to the research and changes there, um, can you say a few words on continuous flow synthesis for drug synthesis and what, where you think this field is going? Yeah, so we started this 20 years ago. We were some of the first ones to do flow chemistry. And of course, I mean, if you talk to most people, they tell you what's so special about this, right? And I used to say, well, you know, chemists used to do things like in a bathtub. And the bigger the chemistry gets, the bathtub gets bigger. And so if something explodes, it becomes problematic. So I think of not using a bucket, but using a pipe through the chemistry. So the, I think the method is quite simple. I'm very happy to see that continuous flow chemistry has now proliferated throughout industry and academia. Um, most recently for us, we have looked into systems that can run autonomously. So I can see multiple applications. Um, on the application side, of course, people think about having remote systems that allow you to make uh, drug substances in remote locations. Maybe people fly to Mars, they can make their own medications. I think that's maybe a little far off. Um, a little closer to home in one of the projects that I'm very excited about right now is a possibility of totally changing the way we do chemistry. Because what we do today as scientists is we run a reaction and then we report the results. But there's no way to know for a reader where those results actually happened or whether we sort of just maybe improve the yield a little bit. And um, so I think it's possible to have remote autonomously run instruments where people can actually run their reactions, not physically in their own lab anymore, and that the data that they generate can then be published and the publication, anybody who wants to repeat it, can go back and run the reaction in the same what we call chem servers. 
So that way you know if that's published in that server, that will run a second and third and fifth time, and that by the reproducibility of a data would be greatly improved. So I think there are lots of ways we can think about it. Chem server is one thing, making inexpensive drugs all around the world is another application. Mm. And you mentioned um, publication. Um, do you think today we have to look at other um, ideas of how we publish our research? Yeah, I think um, the transformation, the digital transformation has clearly given us possibilities uh, that we couldn't conceive beforehand. Um, as a student, I always like to get Anke Wande Kemi and uh, in my mailbox and then you use to read a physical journal and uh, I think that's very rare now. Um, and today basically anybody is able to publish anything. Um, not peer-reviewed maybe, <laughs> but in principle you can put it out there. So I think your question may even go to the fact is, is peer review still the way we should be doing things in the future? Uh, because in principle we could all run a blog and whatever I find in my lab I just put it in my blog and then people um, can follow that. Of course, no quality control, nothing, but that'd be one way to go. I think we're going to see the high quality journals persist in the future as well. I think there's a real need for peer-reviewed high quality research. Um, and then I think we'll see more and more blog type, um, maybe preprint type uh, things where people report results, maybe not immediately um, peer-reviewed, maybe only comments um, afterwards. I think those are all models that can, fun uh, can work and I think in the long, uh, long term it will not be possible uh, to have this immense increase in chemical literature because I think it's just, at least for me, it's become too much and I don't know who can even try to attempt to read most of the things. I think yes, there will be tremendous changes and I think it will be driven by technology and I'm not sure that people only type papers in the future. I could also think of videos being produced. Sometimes it's very difficult to describe an apparatus or a setup and I think augmenting that with actually live videos is something that can be done. Of course, many publications are already going down that path. So I think it's an exciting time and I'm pretty sure I was totally off and in 20 years we'll laugh about this and we'll have a different way to do it much better. Hmm. And looking into the future, what uh, do you wish for yourself for the next 10 years? Well, I wish for myself and anybody I know, of course, good health. Oh, yeah. That's the most important thing as well. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Otherwise, we might not be here in 10 years. Um, but let's <laughs> take that aside for one second. And scientifically, um, I think there's always excitement um, happening. I mean, area of carbohydrates for me, there's still plenty of things to do. I think in chemistry, there are many things to do. To me, for chemists, one of the great challenges is to go from the um, non-sustainable way we um, produce many things today to a um, sustainable way and I think that means a totally rethinking of all the processes and all of our products and in many or most of our products uh, globally we use chemistry so I think we will require a circular economy, also a circular chemical um, economy uh, where we use mainly um, sustainable materials. I think in the old days, 200 years ago, almost all our materials, our medications, our food came from plant materials. Um, today we're using a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of inorganic materials that we dig out of, uh, out of the ground. Um, I think that's not something we can keep doing the next 200 years. And I would love to see a, a time when most of the materials we use may be again um, plants. Um, in that case, of course, carbohydrates. I think they can be uh, wonderful for doing many, many things. Uh, they can be reused afterwards and um, recycled easily. Um, I think there are already very good bases for that. Um, what I would like to see the next 10 years or 20 years is a lot more effort in this area because then chemists uh, could actually help to um, make this a circular economy and I think the time is now uh, to get this started. The technologies are there but I think there are lots of chemical questions that have to be addressed. Okay, thank you very much. It was nice talking to you. Nice to talk to you.